Good morning students and we are steaming on with our ophthalmology clerkship video sessions. Today we'll be talking about angle closure and angle closure glaucoma, which is one of the few things that we do under undergraduates that demands a little bit of urgency um, because you have a very short period of time in at least two of these conditions in which you need to act rather quickly in order to provide the best management to your patient so that he or she becomes comfortable as soon as possible. You'll see what I mean as we move on. Uh, this is our third differential of the red eye theme and this is the diagnosis which produces the most pain. In fact, the third worst type of pain a patient can experience is the pain of angle closure, a specific type of angle closure that we'll just do. The other two types of pain are the myocardial infarction, the pain of the heart attack and pain of the mesenteric ischemia or gut ischemia. Um, this is what we'll be doing today. We'll start off by reviewing open angle. We'll move to some special examination techniques for angle closure. Then we'll classify angle closure, talk about primary angle closure, secondary angle closure, and then we'll just do an overview of surgical management of angle closure glaucoma. Um, we'll start off by reviewing open angle glaucoma and why we are doing that is, well, because I want to and because the, the term glaucoma has a very specific meaning and it's just not high intraocular pressure or raised intraocular pressure and we just need to keep that in our mind. So if you remember from our discussion on open angle, it was a triad in which we had progressive optic neuropathy with characteristic visual field effects in which intraocular pressure was a significant risk factor. It's a risk factor people in open angle glaucoma. It's not an etiologic factor. It's an risk factor in all types of glaucoma. Uh, and that is what I want you to sort of, you know, instill into your mind. Even when we talk about glaucoma in terms of angle closure, we are talking about a condition in which you must have optic neuropathy and visual field effects. And just high pressure is not going to, you know, be enough to call the disease glaucoma. You need to have these two things as well, neuropathy and visual field effects even in the setting of angle closure. So I'm sure that we have done this so many times that you know which I, uh, this visual field is off and I'll give you a hint, it's not the right eye. So let's define angle closure and this is a group of diseases which is characterized by closure of the anterior chamber angle by interior displacement of the iris towards the cornea. And the biggest problem is that there are so many classification systems and there's such a lot of contention that, and, and these classifications at times tend to conflict with one another, not agree with one another. And then there are classifications that are just, you know, made by individuals or, or, or you know, certain specific institutions so that it becomes easier for them to manage their patients and also to develop protocols. So it's really frustrating. So what I have done for undergraduates is to try and make it as simple as possible and as logical as possible to relieve some of the frustration and stresses that come up, come with, you know, opening a, a book and trying to figure out what this angle closure business is. And this is only made worse because there are certain texts around that are using terminologies that haven't been used for 50 years or more. We have learned so much about glaucoma so much more about open angle, so much more about angle closure that some of the terminologies that were once used are no longer relevant or no longer even correct or appropriate. So that, that's making the thing worse. You open a book and you see terminologies that you really don't see anywhere and then you see, uh oh, this is what everybody else says. Uh, when I say everybody else, all of the your colleagues. So if I don't do this, probably I will not pass, but that's not really true. I'll introduce you to those terms and I'll also use terminology that is more modern or more appropriate for the times we are living in. Strange times we are living in. So the classification that we are going to use is going to be based on the cause of the interior displacement of the iris, what makes the iris moves interiorly. And this and that divides the disease into a primary and a secondary form. A primary form is primarily See what I did there? Due to an, an anatomically small eyeball. So the eyeball's axial length is smaller than normal. A secondary uh, angle closure is because of a specific pathological condition within the eye. Uh, for example, acute anterior uveitis. And as you will see, there are either push factors or pull factors that make the iris displace anteriorly. We'll see that in a bit. 
So this, this picture basically shows the difference between a normal angle and an angle in which the iris has displaced anteriorly. So the part on the left is showing you what a normal open angle is, and you can see the flow of the aquas uh, as outlined by the blue arrows, and they have free access to the trabecular meshwork. So in angle closure, what has happened is that the iris has displaced interiorly from its normal position. This is the normal position of the iris, and I'll just bring it here as well. And it has displaced interiorly. We'll do all the causes that makes the iris displace interiorly, and when it displaces interiorly, it blocks this trabecular meshwork so that the aquas no longer can flow out of the eye and which causes a sudden in, well it causes a rise in intraocular pressure so this is what interior displacement or this is what i mean or what is meant by interior displacement of the iris it displaces anteriorly towards the cornea from its normal position so this is how i would like to describe a normal flow of aqueous this lady is the aqueous these revolving doors a trabecular meshwork and the aqueous can simply move out of the trabecular meshwork in angle closure, what happens is that the aqueous runs smack into the trabecular meshwork trying to get out. It can't simply because the trabecular meshwork is blocked. So this is what angle closure is. And this was what normal angle was, which allows free movement of aqueous outside the eye. All right. Now we're going to be talking about certain special examination techniques. They're not really that special. And we have actually talked about uh, some of these things before. We'll just sort of add on to it or build on to it to make our discussion more relevant for angle closure. So first is digital tonometry, which is using your fingers to measure the pressure of the eye. And it is either going to be hard or soft. We have an entire video on digital tonometry. I encourage you to view that. If you have not seen that, it's in one of the, it's one of the clinical skill videos. The other is in TA chamber depth assessment. We have done that also in, uh, when we were talking about torch examination, I'm sure you have done torch examination uh, clinical skill, uh, but we'll sort of review it briefly today as well. We have talked about gonioscopy before when we were talking about open angle. We'll build on it today and we will talk about how to actually grade the interior chamber using gonioscopic techniques. So let's just review interior chamber depth assessment, assessment and we use the torch using uh, oblique illumination or perpendicular illumination. And what we were trying to do is to see how much of the iris was illuminated when the light is shining from the side uh, perpendicular and the idea is as the iris displaces anteriorly as shown on the picture on the right the anterior chamber becomes shallow the depth of the anterior chamber decreases obviously because the anterior chamber is between the iris and the cornea so this is your anterior chamber and now what has happened is because of the anterior displacement of the iris the depth of the anterior chamber has reduced and what that does also is it blocks the light from reaching the iris on the opposite side so you get a little bit of a dark shadow there and that tells you that the anterior chamber is now shallow i'll show you a picture how that appears uh, next so normal anterior chamber depth shallow anterior chamber and when you do this with a torch in in on a patient or or on another individual this is what you would see when you see a normal anterior chamber depth and this is a shallow anterior chamber and this is that dark crescent uh, that I was talking about before on the side opposite of the illumination. Now we're going to be talking about the grading and the assessment of the anterior chamber angle, i.e. we're also be going, we are talking about gonioscopy next. We have talked about gonioscopy before, but we'll just quickly review it here as well. The reason that we need to do gonioscopy in order to view the angle is because of the phenomena of total internal reflection. Uh, you can go back to the discussion on open angle to find out more what total internal reflection was, but I'm sure you know it. You did it in school. So we need to use a special lens called a gonioscope and do a procedure called gonioscopy in order to view the angle. And this is a gonioscope on an eye during gonioscopy. And because the angle structures are 360 degrees, uh, I showed you a, a nice animation when we were doing open angle. So we need to view the entire angle. And what we can do is we can simply rotate the gonioscope to see all of the angle. And I'll show you a little video how rotation is done. Look at the hand. This is how the lens is rotated so that uh, you can have a look at the entire angle. The picture on the right is a gonioscopic view of the anterior chamber angle and we'll try and make some sense of it. And this is an artist impression of what we are seeing. And we'll start off with structure one and structure one is the border of the pupil right here. 
Structure two is actually the very periphery of the iris right here. And this periphery is a periphery that will insert into the ciliary body. Remember, iris originates from the ciliary body. So between one and the end of two is all of the iris. So between the pupillary border and the insertion of the iris into the ciliary body band or the peripheral iris is the iris. Number three is the ciliary body band, which is this dark structure right here. And this is the structure where the anterior chamber angle actually begins from. So this is one of the first structures, thus this is given in blue, and this is right here on this picture. Beyond this really, and it's dark because ciliary body, this is the pigmented part of the ciliary body. Um, and right in front of it, uh, we have a white line, which is a scleral spur, which is right here. This is a projection of the sclera into the anterior chamber angle, and it appears white because sclera is white. So this is structure number four. Structure number five is the actual trabecular meshwork, and as we did from our discussion on uh, open angle glaucoma, this is the structure which allows the aqueous to flow out of the eye. It produces a little bit of resistance so that the eye can generate a little bit of pressure. Um, so this is the trabecular meshwork, which is structure number five. And finally, we have another white line at the top, and that is called the Schwalbe's line, which is the termination of the posterior aspect of the cornea on the endothelial of the cornea, and this beyond which we will have the sclera starting. So these four structures, three, four, five, six, is what makes up the anterior chamber angle. Um, and, and when you'll see the description of the anterior chamber angle and their structure in, in the slides that are upcoming, you'll see ciliary body band slash root of iris. It, it's ciliary body band slash root of iris because the root of iris inserts into the ciliary body band uh, as we just talked about it in a minute ago. And this little picture is the picture that's taken from the animation I showed you. And we're looking at the angle as if we are standing on the pupil and we are gazing straight into the angle as you can see from the gonioscopic view. It's actually like you're standing here on the pupil and you're looking at the angle like you're standing in this little animation that I showed you. One very important thing to consider here is that this canal of Schlem is not a part of the anterior chamber angle. It lies, 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 it lies outside the anterior chamber angle. So don't confuse or say that canal of Schlem is in the anterior chamber angle. It's outside of it. Let's build upon what we have done and talk about grading of the angle, which is more relevant to our discussion today. Let's define angle closure, and we did that as a group of diseases in which there is closure of the anterior chamber angle because of anterior displacement of the iris towards the cornea. So what would happen is as the iris is displacing anteriorly, the iris would start covering these angle structures. Remember there were four, root of the iris, scleral spur, trabecular meshwork, and shawl base nine. As the iris would move uh, or displace anteriorly, it will start covering one or more of these structures as we'll just see. And as it is covering those structures, you won't be able to see them through the gonioscope because the iris would be in the way. And because iris is in the way, that structure would also tend to stop functioning. And of all of these structures, really there is one which has any function, which is the trabecular meshwork. And this trabecular meshwork, once the iris covers it and it's out of the view, it also stops functioning because the iris is blocking it. And trabecular meshwork is a structure that allows the aqueous to go out of the eye. So once the iris has displaced interiorly enough to block the trabecular meshwork, the angle will not be able to filter the aqueous out of the eye or drain the aqueous out of the eye. So we need to have a system in which we can say how what is the configuration of the angle? I mean, is the angle working? Is it not working? Is it of a normal uh, dimension? Is it shallow? And remember, as the iris moves anteriorly, the anterior chamber shallows out as well. We saw that when we were talking about oblique illumination. Uh, because as the iris would move anteriorly, obviously the anterior chamber depth would decrease because the anterior chamber is between the cornea and the iris. So that system which tells us is the angle in normal configuration? Are you seeing all the structures? Is the uh, iris moved anteriorly or displaced anteriorly causing the anterior chamber and the angle to shallow out? Is, is, is called the Schaefer system, the system that we do. There are other systems as well, but we do the Schaefer system. It's relatively easy to understand. And what it does is it grades the angle from four, which is an open angle, all the way to zero, which is a totally closed angle. And this grading is done on the number of structures that you see. And obviously there are four structures. We start counting from the root of the iris of the ciliary body, then to structure number two, scleral spur, structure number three, trabecular meshwork, and structure number four, Schwalbe's line. 
Let's start grading our angle. And this diagram, the one we saw on the previous page, uh, sh is, is showing you the interior chamber angle and the four structures uh, together with these arrows, which are actually light rays that are coming off the illuminator would bounce off the angle structures, go through the gonioscope, and you will be able to see them. This is the normal position of the iris, position number four. And when the iris is in its normal position, you can see all of these structures within the interior chamber angle. So this is a grade four angle. You can see everything. And this angle is considered open. And angle will always be considered open as long as the trabecular meshwork is viewable. And that would imply it's still functioning and the aqueous is moving out of the eye. And this is obviously a normal interior chamber depth. Interior chamber depth is between this, the iris, and the cornea right here. Let's displace the iris interiorly a little bit. And as it displaces interiorly, it'll start blocking off the light rays that were going towards the ciliary body band. So now you're not able to see the ciliary body band anymore. You only see three structures on gonioscopy, scleral spur, trabecular meshwork, and shawl base line. The interior chamber depth, as you can see from here, is obviously shallower than before. This was the interior chamber depth when iris was in its normal position, position four. This is position three or a grade three angle. And you can see the interior chamber is shallowing out. This angle is still open because the trabecular meshwork is still viewable. It's still functioning and moving the aqueous out of the eye. Let's displace the iris even more further ahead to a grade two angle. And a grade two angle obviously implies you're only able to see two structures because the iris has displaced even more interior. You can't even see the scleral spur anymore. You can only see two structures, trabecular meshwork and shawl base line. This is still an open angle. It is an angle that is very close to getting closed, but still open because the trabecular meshwork is viewable, i.e. it's still functioning and moving the aqueous out of the eye. The anterior chamber depth is even shallower than before. And as you will see, this type of angle on gonioscopy is seen in individuals who are suffering from something called an angle closure suspect. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Let's displace the iris even more interior to do position one. Now you can only see one structure, shawl base line. You can't see the trabecular meshwork. You can't see the trabecular meshwork. Trabecular meshwork is no longer working. The aqueous is no longer getting out of the eye. This is now a closed angle because the trabecular meshwork can't be seen. If it's not seen, it's not functioning because the iris has blocked it. So it's not draining the aqueous anymore. The anterior chamber is even shallower. And this is seen in individuals who are suffering from angle closure. And we can even move the iris one more step to a grade zero. You can't see anything. The cornea and the iris are touching one another. So you can't even see the shawl base line. And this is again seen in angle closure and also in angle closure glaucoma. Uh, we'll talk about the distinction between the two as we go on about our diseases and why is one referred to as angle closure and the other as angle closure glaucoma. I'm sure you know glaucoma only happens when you have optic neuropathy and visual field defects. So again, this is a closed angle because obviously trabecular meshwork is not available. It's not functioning. It's not draining the aqueous. So if you see from here, grade four and three angles are okay. Grade two is something of a concern because it might, you know, close. And grade one and zero are closed angles. Uh, this is another table, and this table is simply showing you the number of structures seen, what structures are seen, and how is that angle graded. And again, grade one and zero are the closed angles. Uh, grade four and three are normal angles, or normal four and three is something that you'll see in normal individual. Grade two is an grade two is an includable angle, something that can lead to an angle closure. Uh, or a closed angle. So this is again another picture and again I think we have seen this before if not I'll just explain it. This is how we are seeing the angle. We are standing on the pupil and looking at the angle. Uh, we have talked about it uh, in some detail when we were talking about open angle and we just also mentioned it today. And as you can see as the iris displaces interiorly it covers more and more of these angle structures. As it covers those angle structures those they stop functioning and also the anterior chamber becomes shallower and shallower so from grade four in which you can see all of these structures all the way to grade zero when you can't see anything so this dark band is obviously the ciliary body band this is the scleral spur white line this is the trabecular meshwork and at the top right here is the shawl base line as you can see as the iris is displacing interiorly these structures are disappearing because the iris is blocking them from view. If they are being blocked, they can't function. In a, and the structure that is most important to us in the anterior chamber angle is obviously the trabecular meshwork. Once it stops functioning, i.e. it can't be seen, the pressure in the eye would start rising. And if it's, it's happening in an acute setting, that rise would be dramatic and very rapid. 
So far, we have reviewed open angle, defined angle closure. We have done certain special examination techniques of which the most important is being able to grade the interior chamber angle. Uh, I'll let you in on a little bit of secret. Undergraduates are not supposed to do gonioscopy, but they are supposed to interpret it, not by looking at the actual angle uh, view, which is kind of difficult. Uh, you are supposed to uh, sort of grade it based on the the diagram that you saw, uh, which is kind of simpler. So you just need to remember those four structures. Now we're going to be talking about classification of angle closure. And remember, folks, this is a minefield. Don't get yourself blown up by it. I'll give you a classification that is the simplest that I can come up with. I've revised it maybe eight or nine times since I started doing undergraduate teaching about what it's 14 years now uh, and it is something that helps best and uh, best and in the simplest way explain what uh, angle closure is how we can safely classify it without getting ourselves blown up so I classify or it's actually classified this way uh, but this is something that's picked up from multiple classification to come up with one system that's the simplest for undergraduates. Uh, so angle closure is classified into a primary and a secondary form. A primary form is when you have an anatomical issue with the eye, your eyeball is small and it's further classified into a primary angle closure suspect, uh, acute primary angle closure, intermittent angle closure and primary angle closure glaucoma and they're sort of chronologically following one another. So you have PACS, then APAC, then IAC, then PACG. Obviously, it's not important that every individual who has PACs would move on to APAC or IAC or PACG. Secondary angle closure occurs when there is a cause, a definitive cause in the eye, another cause, a secondary cause, which leads to an angle closure. And this is either acute secondary angle closure, ASAC, or secondary angle closure, glaucoma, SAGAG. Um, as you'll see, there are certain uh, conditions of acute angle closure, that acute secondary angle closure that can cause secondary angle closure glaucoma. And there are there is one condition that we'll do at an undergraduate level that might even present as a secondary angle closure glaucoma and totally skip the acute secondary angle closure step altogether. So let's start about start talking about primary angle closure now, and this. These are the four classification and this is how they are roughly defined. Um, I put this here so that when you're reviewing it, you can just look at this slide and review everything. We'll talk about these in a little bit of detail as we move along our discussion. Uh, we'll talk about them once. There's no point talking about them again and again. But just see that until we get to glaucomatous cuffing and visual field effects, none of these entities, i.e. entities one, two, three, are called glaucoma. It's only when you start seeing optic disc cupping and visual field effects do we call this glaucoma. And this is what I said before, that unless you see optic neuropathy or visual field effects, it's not glaucoma, folks. It is simply angle closure with high pressure, maybe. Or even when we talk about primary angle closure suspects, the pressure is elevated. It's not, even the pressure is not elevated. So let's just uh, go over this classification and then we'll talk about uh, how these patients present. And again, as I said, that this is the evolution or chronology. You have PACs to APAC to IAC to PSCG, but it's not necessary that every individual of PACs would go on and evolve into an acute primary angle closure or intermittent angle closure, primary angle closure glaucoma. He might be or she might be PACs. They're usually females all their life and not even know about it. Uh, or they can go on and evolve into one or one or more of these stages. So what is primary angle closure suspect? These are the individuals who have an axially small eyeball with a hypermetropic error of five diopters or more. Remember when you have a small eyeball, your hypermetropic parallel light rays from distance focus behind the retina when eye is at rest. And because your eyeball is smaller, your anterior chamber is shallower, that would imply that your iris and cornea are closer to one another anyways. And when you do gonioscopy on these individuals, you'll find that they have grade two angles, but they don't have elevated IOP and they obviously don't have any cupping or they don't have any visual field effects. And so these individuals are called suspects. They can evolve and go on to a next stage, which is acute primary angle closure, but they just might stay here all their life. So how does a primary angle closure suspect does convert into an uh, acute primary angle closure. Well, 
With increasing age, as your lens is growing thicker, it is pushing the iris further upwards and your interior chamber is becoming even shallower and shallower. There is also a chance because your lens is getting thicker that your iris and lens might come into contact with one another. We'll see how that happens in a bit. As these things are happening, you might have one of these precipitating factors that are listed here, dim illumination, putting midriatic drops in your eye for any reasons, fundus examination without taking a proper history, for example, or you are under a lot of stress, increased sympathetic activity because the dilator pupillary muscle is innervated by the sympathetic system. You know, the fright flight response in which your pupils dilate so that you are able to run away from danger. And all of these three conditions, illumination, therapeutic midriasis, sympathetic system activity, they are all dilating the pupil. And as the pupil dilates, and the lens is thicker because of increasing age, the lens and the iris might come into contact with one another. And that can lead into an acute primary angle closure attack. That's one of the two theories. We'll do the other theory in a bit. And this is how a patient of PACS might convert into APAC or acute primary angle closure with increasing age. And with these one or more of these precipitating factors, it may cause acute primary angle closure. Again, not in every individual, but in individuals who have, have PACs, it is possible with these precipitating conditions and increasing age that they might end up in a prime, acute primary angle closure attack. If this tends to happen again and again, because what happens sometimes is that this attack of acute primary angle closure resolves spontaneously on its own. We'll see how that would happen. And if it happens again and again and again, because you know you have a red eye, it lasts for about an hour or two, and then you are okay, you don't go to a doctor and you go into something called intermittent angle closure, which happens again and again. And multiple attacks of intermittent angle closure can eventually lead to primary angle closure glaucoma because when you have an attack again and again, the inflammation within the eye turns chronic and then you start getting chronic inflammation fibrosis and your iris and the cornea are held together firmly. And because the inflammation is chronic, you don't experience that much pain. Your pain is already being attenuated pain signals from the eye because of multiple attacks of intermittent angle closure. And your eye is a little bit red, not that red, because again, the inflammation is now chronic. So you're not experiencing the symptoms of high pressure when you have high pressure. Does it ring a bell? It should, uh, because primary angle closure. But the difference being in primary angle, uh, primary open angle, sorry, in primary open angle, the angles were open and the patient wasn't symptomatic because the pressure wasn't that high. In this case, in primary angle closure glaucoma, the pressure is going to be higher as we'll just see. But because the inflammation is chronic, the patient is not going to experience much symptoms. In fact, he'll be as, usually as asymptomatic as a patient of primary open angle. So how would we know the difference? Do gonioscopy, look at the angle. We'll talk about it in a bit. So this is how a PSCS patient might convert all the way into a PSCG patient. But this is not going to happen to every individual who has uh, angle closure suspect. Uh, that is why this is all based upon, you know, uh, risk factors and a possibility of ending up in a disease, not a surety of ending up in a disease. So what are the epidemiology or risk factors for primary angle closure? Uh, this primary angle closure, as I said, I'll be introducing older terms to you, was previously called acute congestive glaucoma. This was when glaucoma was just rise in pressure. Because glaucoma is so much more than rise in pressure, we don't call it acute congestive glaucoma anyway, or we call it primary angle closure. It's a bilateral disease because if you have a small eye, chances are you'll have both eyes are small, but the presentation is usually asymmetric. You usually get an attack one eye at a time. And these are the risk factors. Exily small eyeballs, we've already talked about it, which have shallow interior chambers. A family history. Family history is really important because first degree relatives uh, would share anatomic features with one another. So if your uh, siblings have it, you probably have it. Increasing age, because with increasing age, the lens is becoming thicker. So it usually presents between sixth and seventh age. Female gender, uh, maybe because smaller dimensions of the eye or more, more incidence of hypermetropic refractive error and Chinese uh, ethnicity. All of these are risk factors and they're applicable to uh, primary angle closure, uh, primary angle closure suspect, and obviously if it's an acute primary angle closure, it's of also an intermittent angle closure and also primary angle closure glaucoma. So let's just briefly talk about primary angle closure suspect before we move on to the main disease, which is acute primary angle closure. Uh, so these are the individuals who have small eyeballs with shallow interior chambers. 
Their AC depth obviously is less than normal, but the IOP is not yet elevated. Gonioscopically, their angles at best are grade two. So they are open, but occludable, as we talked about before, in three quadrants, more than three quadrants, which is more than 270 degrees of the angle. What do I mean by that? So this is the area of the anterior chamber angle, and I've shown that in, in, in blue. And I've divided them into four quadrants. And if I see not more than grade two angles, i.e. all the angles are less than grade three, in more than three quadrants, quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and I'll, I'm also seeing it in a little bit of quadrant four as well. So I can call them as primary angle closure suspects. This is what I mean by in more than three quadrants or more than 270 degrees of the angle. Because remember, a circle is 360 degrees, each quadrant being 90 degrees. So three, nines, three into nine is 270. So I need a little bit more than 270 degrees. So again, these would individuals would be females with axial hypermetropia of more than five diopters with naturally shallow anterior chambers. And as I said, with increasing age, you have lens that is becoming thicker. So there is more chance of iris and the lens coming into contact with one another. And, and, and under those precipitating conditions in which the pupil dilates, you can have a primary angle closure suspect individual having an attack of acute primary angle closure. Again, it may occur. It's not necessary that it will always occur. So until a time where you have APAC or acute primary angle closure, these individuals are called primary angle closure suspect because there is a suspicion that an acute primary angle closure might occur in them. Individuals with PACS, as I've said before, may never experience an acute attack of primary angle closure even in the presence of these precipitating conditions because not every individual is the same. And unfortunately, books do not, diseases don't read books. If they were following protocols, life would be so much simpler. Now we are coming on to the beef of the topic or the main topic uh, for primary angle closure, which is acute primary angle closure in which we have a raised IOP and this raised and IOP is dramatic and rapid in which the iris is blocking the trabecular meshwork. So if the iris is blocking the trabecular meshwork, we could have, we should have grade one or worse angle, again in three quadrants or more. And we are not calling it glaucoma because this is an acute event. So no cupping or visual field effects. And again, when I show you this picture, I would have grade one or worse angles in more than three quadrants. So quadrant one, two, three, and a little bit in quadrant four. Let's define acute primary angle closure. And this is a condition in which there is a rapid and dramatic increase in intraocular pressure because of the anterior displacement of the iris towards the anterior chamber angle, producing a grade one or zero angle in three quadrants or more in an individual who is a primary angle closure suspect. So remember we did risk factors and not etiologic factors simply because we don't really know the exact mechanism by which a primary angle closure suspect actually becomes a primary angle closure i mean what goes inside the eye that causes these precipitating conditions together with increasing age in a female gender together with maybe first degree relatives and chinese ethnicity to produce this condition we're not really sure but we have two theories a really popular theory and a theory that's really not popular we'll do both because i like the really not popular theory the popular theory is called the pupillary block theory and what is happening in a pupillary block theory is remember these are individuals with small eyeballs and shallow anterior chambers and with increasing age your lens is getting thicker so your lens is getting thicker that means the iris and the lens are getting closer and your iris and the cornea are already closer simply because the anterior chamber depth is shallow. So when you have those precipitating conditions in which the pupil starts dilating, the lens and the iris might come into contact with one another, they might become opposed. And as they are opposed to one another, they will stop the flow of aqueous from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. We have done posterior and anterior chambers, I'm sure you know what they are. I'll show you a picture just in case anyways. And as the aqueous accumulates in the posterior chamber, it starts pushing the iris anteriorly, making it into a bow-like configuration, which is called iris bombi, bombay, bomb, whatever you want to call it. It's got this sound modifier at top. You know those, there's the palpation or do that we have. Never understood what they were for. I made a lot of mistakes abusing those. I really did. So when you have that iris bombi or a bowed iris, this iris would then be pushed against the anterior chamber angle or as it is displaced anteriorly, blocking the angle, producing acute primary angle closure. 
The other theory is called the angle crowding theory. And the simplest way to understand angle crowding theory is to see, is to take the example of a purse string. You know, one of these things. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, and I'll just try and show you how this explains this angle crowding theory. Angle crowding theory. But before I actually start playing with my purse strings, let's just do the pupillary block theory and complete it so that we can move on to the next step. So the pupillary block theory, as I just said, states that as the pupil dilates, uh, and you, uh, because of any one of those precipitating factors, dim light, um, midriasis, putting some drop in your eyes or increased sympathetic activity, your thick lens, because of increasing age, would come in contact with the iris in a, usually in a mid-dilated position because that's dilating, it is coming closer to the lens and your lens is thicker because of age. Remember, as you grow older, you get nuclear sclerosis, your lens is getting thicker. I'm sure you know what that was. Um, uh, so this is a normal flow of aqueous from the posterior chamber right here behind the iris into the anterior chamber between the cornea and the iris and out of the eye through the trabecular meshwork. And as you can see, this is a little bit of a space between the iris and the lens, which allows the aqueous to flow. And we have done this when we talked about open angle. Now, in cases of uh, acute primary angle closure in individuals who have primary angle closure suspect, and you have one of those precipitating conditions, so you have um, maybe dim illumination, maybe you are you know, watching a movie or something. So your pupil is a little bit dilated, and as it dilates, it comes in contact with the lens it physically comes in contact with the lens and blocks this passage, this little passage right here, shown by this arrow. And that would imply that the aqua starts collecting here in the posterior chamber because obviously it can't flow into the anterior chamber because the passage is blocked. And this blockage of the passage is obviously all the way around the pupil because if there is even a little bit of an opening, the aqua would start getting out of the uh, from behind, in, from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. So the pupil is in totality in contact with the lens, blocking the flow of aqua. So the aqua starts collecting in the posterior chamber and it pushes the iris forward. Iris is a very flimsy structure. It's just as flimsy as this purse string is. So it can easily be pushed. So this it can also be pulled, as we'll just see later. So this aqueous collecting in the posterior chamber pushes the iris forwards towards the anterior chamber angle. And if it creates a grade one or a zero angle in which the trabecular meshwork is blocked, if it's blocked, it's non-functioning. We've already discussed uh, why that is and how that is. And that would cause a sudden and dramatic rise in intraocular pressure because the intraocular pressure can no longer get out of the eye. This is how the pupillary block theory explains things. So this is what pupillary block is. This is OCT. This is a normal flat anterior chamber. You can see how nice it is. And this is iris bombay or Bo bombay or bowing of the iris. You can also see the bowing of the iris here. This is what iris bombay is. And this is in response to all the aqueous that's collecting in the posterior chamber, pushing the iris forward. Bombay, bombay, whatever. Don't really care. This is how it would appear on OCT. And as you can see, it has blocked this chamber, this angle right here, anterior chamber angle. Specifically, grade one or grade zero angles are produced because that is actually when the pressure would start rising because the trabecular meshwork is blocked. Moving on to the underdog theory, the angle crowding theory. And the angle crowding theory basically goes like this. As the pupil dilates, the mass of the pupil is moving towards the anterior chamber angle. And this anterior chamber angle is already of a you know a grade two angle because remember these are individuals who are hypermetropic they have shallow anterior chambers their cornea and the iris are closer together anyway thus their anterior chamber angle is shallow usually around grade two and as the pupil dilates the iris crowds the angle it's already a narrow angle a grade two angle and as the iris starts crowding it it becomes a grade one or a zero angle precipitating an acute primary angle closure attack now, I'm going to try and explain this using my purse strings, and these are two purse strings. This is the iris here and here, and in between is the pupil. And as you can see in the picture as well, as the uh, pupil dilates, so I'm going to move it as back as possible, and as the pupil dilates, see the pupil is becoming big, but look at what's happening to the iris uh, at, at the top of the purse strings. As the pupil is dilating more and more, all of this iris right here is 
accumulating in the interior chamber angle. That's where it's going. It's crowding the angle. And as it is crowding the angle, the angle is already narrow. It can actually block the angle, uh, producing a grade one or a zero angle when you do gonioscopy and produce dramatic and rapid rise in IOP precipitating an attack of uh, acute primary angle closure. So this is what happens in a dilating uh, uh, pupil. All of the uh, mass of the iris right here starts accumulating at the interior chamber angle, rising the, raising the pressure. So this is an OCT. This is when our pupil was in a normal configuration, uh, you know, like normal, what normal people is like this, the OCT on the left, and this is a low light condition. As the pupil dilated, the mass of the iris, sorry, right here at the top of the purse strings, started collecting or accumulating in the anterior chamber angle, and it can actually block the angle, causing a sudden and dramatic rise in the intraocular pressure. When I mean block the angle, I mean produce a grade one or a zero angle. So this is the angle crowding theory. Uh, this is the underdog theory. It came up later. Uh, not many supporters of it, more supporters for the pupillary block theory, but irrespective, either of these two mechanisms can bring on an attack of uh, acute primary angle closure in an individual who is a primary angle closure suspect. Just for a little more clarity, I'm going to take the OCTs away and just leave these lines showing you the angle as it starts getting narrow in response to crowding of the iris at the angle. And as you can see on the picture on the right, right here, this is probably a, this is representing a grade one or a grade zero angle. And this is probably this, the one on the left is representing a grade two angle. And it's simply because of what I showed you with the first strings. So uh, how do these patients who are in an acute primary angle closure attack present? They present with a red and a very painful eye with blurry vision and photophobia. They also have headache, a very severe headache, and they may also have a history of vomiting as well. We'll see how that happens in a bit. And they might also give you a history of one of the precipitating factors. I was working in a prolonged, I was working for a long time in an area that wasn't really well lit. Uh, and you might be in a doctor's clinic and you might have pupillary dilatation going on. You may experience attack of your primary angle uh, closure. In fact, that is something that's happened to a colleague of mine. And that colleague had just entered into med school and was having her med school examination. And this is not even an individual who is 50 years of age or 60 years of age. This is an individual who was about 20-ish or maybe even less uh, in age. And she was a hypermetrope, uh, plus six hypermetrope. Nobody asked her. And when she was uh, going through this initial medical school entrance examination, you know, she's supposed to have a complete examination. They started dilating her uh, pupils to have a look at the retina. And then she started complaining of pain as the pupil dilated. And remember, she is young, so this is an odd case, but again, emphasizing how important this small axial length is here. And a little bit after, maybe about half an hour after the second or the third drop went into the eye, she just went nuts. Uh, she says, I can't take it anymore. I have a headache. I can't see anything. And her eyes were red. Everybody was thinking that she is just trying to, you know, wriggle herself out of it. Then they called an ophthalmologist because the person who was doing the assessment there was a family physician. And the ophthalmologist looked at her and said, she's going into angle closure. And then they sort of did the medical therapy as we'll just talk about to reverse the attack. But this is real folks. You can have uh, pupillary dilatation, therapeutic midriasis leading into an attack of uh, acute primary angle closure. It's, I have, it's, 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 it's happened to a colleague, so I'm pretty sure it's happened to other people. And obviously sympathetic overdrive because the dilator pupillae is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system. The picture on the right shows an eye that is undergoing an acute primary angle closure attack, and the picture on the left is a normal picture. And I've drawn some arrows of various colors, which is actually showing you the changes that are seen in an eye undergoing an, an acute primary angle closure attack. And the first thing that you would obviously notice is the size of the pupil. The pupil is mid-dilated. And even though you're putting a lot of light into the eye, the pupil is not reactive. So the pupil is mid-dilated, non-reactive. That's the first thing that you should able, be able to tell right away. It's such a big difference. 
The other difference that you would see is shown by the blue arrow in which is circumcorneal congestion or congestion that is most around the cornea. It's also called circumciliary or limbal congestion. We have seen this before when we talked about keratitis and we'll see it again when we talk about uveitis. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, two more arrows. Look at the light, reflection of the light or the flash that's used to take this picture and see how different it is. This one is very uniformish, the one on the left, the one on the right has a lot of dispersion to it. And that ties into a yellow arrow. If you see through the cornea, you can see very clear detail on the left, but the cornea, the details of the anterior chamber of the right eye are very hazy. And that's because the cornea is hazy. And how does that uh, sort of tie in with the with the green arrow? It's this, this dispersion that you see of light is simply because the cornea is hazy and it's dispersing the light. And that's why you get this sort of dispersed uh, sort of a light reflex um, in this eye. So let's just d describe what we saw. We saw circumcorneal or circumcellular congestion, a mid-dilated non-reactive pupil, a hazy cornea. Uh, this is the camera flash. And the only reason I put this arrow here is so that you can see the disperse, dispersion of light or this really odd looking uh, reflection of light from a hazy cornea. The most important takeaway point right now is the mid-dilated non-reactive pupil. This is the essential sign that distinguishes acute primary angle closure. Acute primary angle closure. It differentiates acute primary angle closure from acute anterior uveitis, which is also called acute iritis on a torch examination. A mid-dilated non-reactive pupil differentiates an acute primary angle closure specifically acute primary angle closure from acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis. Don't forget it, people. I've said it so many times and I've said it out aloud. Um, and that's really important because a hazy cornea and circumcorneal congestion are also seen in acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis as, as it is also called. So when you are shown a picture or a patient, and this is the essential sign that distinguishes between these two conditions uh, on a torch examination. Another picture, similar things that we saw before. Again, I'm highlighting mid-dilated non-reactive pupil for you. And these are, again, the signs I've listed them down. Decreased visual acuity down to hand movements. A hard and a tender eye. And you do this on digital tonometry. The intraocular pressure is more than 40 millimeters, usually 60 to 80 millimeters. Compare this to open angle glaucoma where the pressure hardly ever rises to above 40. Here the pressure is usually almost always above 40. Circumcorneal congestion you can see in a hazy cornea which is also described as a steamy cornea. Like if you take a shower with a warm water in winters, if you have warm water in winters, you know, third world countries or third world problems. Little, little problems that we have. Uh, your looking glass steams up. That is how this cornea has been described. Uh, Mid-dilated non-reactive pupil, really important because it is the essential sign that distinguishes between acute primary angle closure and acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis, as it's called on a torch examination. Why do we have all of these things? Well, we have circumcorneal congestion, which is also called limbal congestion or circumciliary congestion, simply because of inflammation. We have inflammation in the eye. Why do we have inflammation? It's just going to come up in a bit. The decreased vision is simply because of the hazy cornea. It's not allowing light to properly enter into the eye. And also because of mid-dilated pupil, which is allowing a lot of light to enter into the eye, so sort of interfering with your visual acuity. Remember, these are hypermetropic individuals to begin with anyway. You have pain and tenderness simply because of ischemia. And you have inflammation because of ischemia. You have ischemia because of high pressure. That high pressure is causing ischemia of the iris, which is causing that pain. Ischemic pain uh, is really bad. Myocardial infarction pain, mesenteric gut ischemia, ischemia of uh, iris in primary, acute primary angle closure. Photophobia is because of mid-dilated pupil, a lot of light going in. And you have uh, hazy cornea. You have a hazy cornea because that high pressure uh, together with ischemia is making your sodium potassium pump, which is in the endothelial of the cornea, stop working. And as they stop working, the clarity of the cornea is lost. And the second thing is that high pressure is, is, is you know, is, is affecting the integrity of the tight junctions in, in your corneal endothelium cell so that uh, aqueous can go inside of it a fluid can move inside of the cornea, producing a hazy cornea. Mid-dilated non-reactive people because your iris is ischemic, because of high IOP. 
And as long as the iris ischemia persists, the iris is not going to move away from the angle because it's not working. It's ischemic. It's just stuck there. It's not going to work no matter what you do. Even if you put 10 drugs into the eye that uh, stimulate the sphincter of the iris, the iris simply won't work because it's ischemic. So the reason that you have a mid dilated non-reactive pupil is because of iris ischemia because of high pressure. And as long as the iris ischemia persists, the iris will continue to occlude the angle, producing grade one or grade zero angles. Vomiting is simply because of overflow of signals from the pain center to the vomiting center. See, I produced that ni nice animation for you. Mid dilated non-reactive pupil is seen in acute primary angle closure, which distinguishes it or dis yeah, distinguishes it from acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis as it is also called on torch examination. How do we manage it? Because obviously the patient is here for management. And as these things usually occur in dim level of illumination, the patient is usually presenting to an ER setting. So you might not have uh, access to the proper equipment in an eye clinic in order to deal with these patients. And even house physicians have to deal with these patients. So you, as a family physician who is graduated and a patient comes to you in an evening, you should be able to diagnose it on a torch. I have told you how to do it. Remember the size of the pupil together with the history, female gender, hypermetropic error, age, together with a mid-dilated non-reactive pupil should point you towards an attack of acute primary angle closure. So how do we manage it? We need to do two things. The first thing we need to do is to reverse the iris ischemia. And to reverse the iris ischemia, we need to lower the intraocular pressure because if you saw here, iris becomes ischemic when the pressure is more than 40 millimeters of mercury. So the first thing we need to do is to lower the pressure to reverse iris ischemia. And then what we need to do is to actually pull the iris away from the angle. And we do that by obviously contracting it, by stimulating the sphincter of uh, sphincter muscle. So this is the situation we are in right now. So the first thing we need to do is that this iris that has now blocked the anterior chamber angle, this is obviously a grade zero angle because the iris and the cornea are in contact with one another. I'm sure you know what a grade zero angle is. We have talked about it in quite a lot of detail. So the first thing we need to do is to re reduce ischemia. For that, we need to reduce the IOP. Fine, we have done that. And then what we do is we need to reverse the anterior displacement. We need to reverse this. And once the ischemia is, is relieved, it will eventually happen on its own, but it'll take quite a bit of time. So we can accelerate this process of reversing the displacement by pulling the iris away from the angle, opening the angle and re relieving the attack. And we pull this by using drugs or a drug more appropriately, which acts or which is a parasympathomimetic. I'm sure you know what it is by now. So step one, reduce pressure to relieve ischemia. Step two, reverse displacement by pulling the iris away from the angle. Uh, and the other thing that we need to do is to make sure this attack doesn't happen again. Remember, this is a hypermetropic patient. If it's happened once, it can happen again. And if you remember intermittent angle closure, the intermittent angle closure is intermittent or it happens again and again or is recurrent simply because this attack broke on its own without intervention. How does it happen? We'll just talk about it. So we need to make sure that this attack doesn't happen again and again because this patient will obviously go into another attack because we can't do anything about the small eyeball length. Can we now? Can we now? So to do step one, break uh, acute attack of acute primary angle closure. See what I did, acute, acute. Uh, I could have written break attack, but you know, a little bit of fun, humor. So break acute attack, medical management. If medical management fails, we can also do anterior chamber paracentesis. R reduce a little bit of pressure in the eye by doing paracentesis of the anterior chamber. It's not the safest thing to do because it's like, putting a needle into a highly inflated balloon, poof. So it's only done in cases of, it's similar to putting a needle into a highly inflated balloon. So if medical management fail, we move on to surgical management. We just don't start off with uh, surgical management. The medical management, which is a preferred choice, starts off by lowering the IOP rather rapidly. We need to do that to reverse the iris ischemia because remember, as long as the iris is ischemic, it will continue to block the angle as it can't move. It's ischemic. Uh, in order to relieve the ischemia, we need to bring the pressure down from 40 millimeters of mercury. Some books would say down 
from more than 40 millimeters of mercury. Some book would say that the iris becomes ischemic at 50. We need to reduce the pressure uh, to reverse iris ischemia, whether it be 40 millimeters of mercury or 50 millimeters of mercury. We just need to bring the eye pressure down to relieve the ischemia so that the iris can actually start moving. Once the pressure is down, you can actually then think about pulling the uh, iris away from the interior chamber angle. And although once the ischemia is relieved, the iris would eventually move away from the angle on its own, but it would do it rather sluggishly. Remember, it's been under ischemic attack, so it will move rather slowly. We can make this faster by using a parasympathomimetic drop, pilocarpine, which can act on the sphincter pupillae and in assist in the uh, iris moving away from the angle because you have relieved the ischemia, good, the iris can move again. We need to make it move faster. So we put the drug in, make the sphincter pupillae, pull the iris away from the angle to reverse the iris displacement as we saw in the picture uh, just a couple of slides ago. Uh, so the pilocarpine is very, has very little use these days. Remember when we we're talking about open angle, we said it's not a prescription drug, but it is sort of useful here. But you don't start putting pilocarpine after the pressure has reduced a below 40. No, you start putting pilocarpine from the minute you have made the diagnosis and you have initiated medical management. Simply because the concentration of pilocarpine would start building up in the anterior chamber and as soon as the pressure reduces to below 40, it will start working immediately. Sometimes, as I've said before, the attack spontaneously resolves on its own within a couple of hours of onset so the patient doesn't even go to a doctor. And this is a self-limiting uh, recurrent phenomenon as a term that intermittent angle closure. We'll do intermittent angle closure in a bit. So intermittent angle closure is a possibility. Why that happens, we'll talk about it. So, But this is a case in which the patient might never even come to a clinic or a hospital or an ER. Sometimes sitting in an ER, the attack simply just resolves on its own. So this is why I've put it here. So these are, this is how medical management is performed. We need to bring the pressure down rather rapidly. So we're using hyperosmotic agents, mannitol or glycerol, to pull the water out of the eye. We need to take proper history if you're using mannitol or glycerol. Mannitol might cause cardiac overload to take a good history. CVS issues, glycerol might worsen diabetes. But if you have a patient who has both cardiac issues and diabetes, use glycerol. Diabetes is easier to control than fluid overload. Pilocarpine, one drop every 20 minutes, beta blocker, alpha agonist, topical, and oral carbonic hydrase inhibitors. All these are one drop. Pilocarpine is more than that. Oral carbonic anhydrase is 500 mg stat. Do check for sulfur allergy if you are using CAIs, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, either topical or oral. And a steroid drop. And a steroid drop is simply to reduce the inflammation. One drop is now going to cause cataract or glaucoma. Pilocarpine, as I said, constricts the iris and pulls it away from the angle. Really important drug, but only starts working when the pressure is less than 40 because even if you put pilocarpine in, when the pressure is more than 40, iris ischemic, it won't respond to pilocarpine. But it doesn't mean that we only put it once the pressure is low. No, we put it when you start the management uh, so that the concentration within the eye starts building up. If the patient is experiencing pain, we can give injection of a dichloran or if he or she is experiencing uh, vomiting, you can give one of the many drugs that can be used to control uh, vomiting. I'm sure you know what they are. That's why I've not put them here. You know, leave something for you to figure out on your own. Really important that. These are the various doses. Um, see, there's no prostaglandin here because prostaglandin is a pro-inflammatory uh, pro drug. So it can worsen the in, uh, inflammation within the eye. So we're not using it. So this is how anterior chamber paracentesis is done if the medical management fails uh, within a couple of hours to open the angle. If your patient is sitting on a slit lamp, you use a needle like this and very carefully, remember it's like putting a needle in a hyperinflated balloon. So we just need to remove a couple of drops and that's it to bring the pressure down. Here we go, here we go. Very gently. Little bit of aqueous coming out is more than enough because we just need to reduce the pressure enough so that the uh, iris ischemia is reversed. You speed it up. I'm just showing you how it's done. Maybe some people are, it's right to be curious about this. It's something that, you know, is very interesting at least if you are an ophthalmologist. So this is how anterior chamber paracentesis is done in case your medical management fails within a couple of hours to open the angle, relieve virus ischemia. So now that we have done first part, we need to ensure that this never happens again. Because remember, we can't really do much about 
small axial lens now, can we? Your eye is small, your eye is small. So what we need to do is to make sure that this iris does not block the flow of aqueous again by closing the interior chamber angle. Remember, we don't want the angle going into grade one or grade zero again in more than three quadrants as we have described. So we do this by removing a piece of the iris, which is called peripheral iridotomy. One time, this is now done with laser, YAG laser. We have talked about YAG laser before when we were talking about cataracts, yttrium aluminum garnet laser. It was done with scissors before when lasers were not around. It was called peripheral iridectomy. Now iridotomy, iridectomy are used interchangeably. And because individuals usually have both eyes that are small, do a prophylactic PI in the other eye. Why do you want a patient to come in with an attack in the other eye and then do a PI in the other eye? You, the patient is there, do a PI in the unaffected eye, the other eye. Be done with it. You don't want the patient coming again. If you do one PI and the PI, remember you're doing it in a living tissue iris, it might heal, you might, it might have not created a big enough opening. So you create another PI. If that PI also faint, trabeculectomy is then indicated. What is trabeculectomy? We'll talk about it towards the end of our discussion. So this is how um, a peripheral iridotomy works. This is a normal open angle. This is a narrow angle, you know, primary angle closure suspect, and you can have pupillary block in primary angle closure suspect, which can lead to a acute primary angle closure attack. So what we do, we take a bit of the iris away by using lasers or scissors so that even if we have a narrowing angle or an angle or an iris that's approaching the anterior chamber angle, there is no iris here. It can't block the angle, no iris. So it's like a pressure cooker safety valve. Uh, this is how it's done using laser. This is the iris, look how beautiful it is. Um, and this is, whoopsie, here we go, more zoomed in picture. This is the laser spot, the yellow arrow. This is from the rootatlas.com, very good website. And here we go. And as you fire the laser, it starts taking away iris tissue. So it produces a little bit of an opening, which is the peripheral iridotomy. It's called peripheral iridotomy because it's done in the peripheral iris. Why it's done peripherally? Think about it, it's just coming up. So it needs to be wide enough and open enough so that it can actually function and, you know, allow aqueous to pass through. So you need to create a good size peripheral iridotomy. You can see it opening up. You can see all of this iris pigment moving away from it, uh, from this opening, which is showing you that the aqueous is now gushing out of it. That's a very good sign. You see all this haze, which is iris pigment released from the iris. That's the neighbor's dog that started barking for some reason. It can also be done with scissors. And I'll just, move it a little further so that it is we are entering into the eye and now what we are going to use are some scissors and we are just going to cut a bit of iris tissue here we go and we're going to push the iris back in doing a peripheral iridectomy to be more precise remember it's done with scissors so iridectomy here this is our little opening nice little opening since we have lasers we don't need to take the patient into an ot and do this in an ot we can just do it in an OPD procedure, sitting a patient uh, on a slit lamp with a laser mounted to it. But when we didn't have that, or if some places don't have that, this is still a possibility using a scissor and creating an opening in the peripheral iris. And this is to prevent future attacks. And do it in both eyes, people. The eye with the attack, once the attack is relieved, and also in the other unaffected eye. Remember I said peripheral iridectomy or iridotomy is done in the periphery. Well, it's not only done in the periphery, it's also done near the top of the iris at the 12 o'clock position, right here and not at the bottom here. Uh, I hope you can see me through the text here, yeah, you can. So it's done here and not here. So A in the periphery and B at the top. Why is that? Well, that's simply to prevent diplopia or double vision. Uh, let's see how that happens. So this is what how no, normally light rays focus on the retina. I'm sure you know what this is. You're bored with refractive errors. Let me not bore you anymore. If you do it inferiorly, you have another set of light rays that can focus on the retina and produce two images of the same object leading to diplopia. You don't want diplopia. So what you do it, you do it at the top. So this doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because we have the upper lid covering the upper two millimeters of the cornea, thus also the peripheral iris. That's why it's done in the periphery and superiorly so that patients do not complain of double vision. Ah, clever. Now we'll talk about, and that's the discussion of acute primary angle closure, which is the most important uh, entity in our primary angle closure discussion, acute primary angle closure. 
and we are done with it. I hope you had fun, but we are not done with the topic yet. Remember we said you can have spontaneously resolving attack of acute primary angle closure, which is then called intermittent angle closure. And the presentation is again very similar to acute primary angle closure with the exception that these attacks spontaneously resolve on their own. And the reason that this is happening is because the ischemia within the eye shuts the ciliary body down. Remember we have ischemia because of high pressure and that shuts the ciliary body down. Shutting the ciliary body down means aqueous production stops which means pressure in the eye goes down, which relieves iris ischemia. And gradually and slowly, the iris can pull itself away from the angle. There is no pilocarpine going into the eye. And remember, pilocarpine is just accelerating or assisting in the process. The iris itself will also come back. So in cases of intermittent angle closure, once the ischemia settles on its own because of ciliary body shutdown, the iris simply and slowly, gradually comes back to its normal position once it's no longer ischemic attack resolved and this usually resolves within a couple of hours of starting and the patient usually does not seek medical attention at all and that is why it tends to happen again and again. So since this is a recurrent phenomena, it happens again and again, this recurrence would cause damage within the eye because the pressure in the eye intermittently rises and the damage is mostly seen in two structures which are of the two signs that are important at an undergraduate level, and these are glaucom flecken and iris atrophy. Glaucom flecken is damage to the lens producing cataract. Glaucom, high pressure from the time glaucom, glaucoma was just high pressure, and flecken flex, small areas of cataract on the lens because of high pressure. Iris atrophy, again, is the damage to the iris because of high pressure. And since we have already talked about that these individuals are not going to seek medical attention because the attack spontaneously resolves, these two signs, glaucom flecken and iris atrophy, are usually seen when the patient goes to the doctor uh, with complaints of uh, symptoms that are consistent with primary angle closure glaucoma. He's not going to go to a doctor with intermittent angle closure because if he was going to a doctor, that would be the end of it. He wouldn't be in a cycle of breaking attacks, repeating attacks. Sometimes what happens is you have a couple of attacks and you're so frustrated that you go to a doctor. So they might be picked up in an intermittent angle closure state, but they are usually picked up in a primary angle closure glaucoma state, the two signs of uh, glaucom flecken and iris atrophy. And this recurrent, these recurrent attacks may eventually lead to chronic inflammation and primary angle closure glaucoma, as we shall discuss momentarily. Now we will talk about primary angle closure glaucoma. We have reached a stage where angle closure now can cause glaucomatous optic disc cupping and visual field defect. Just thus we are using the term or the word glaucoma with it. Uh, and what is this is a condition in which you have optic disc cupping and visual field defects when gonioscopically you have less than or grade one angles, usually grade zero angles. So when we are doing a gonioscopy, uh, and we've seen this picture before. So when we have a grade one or worse angle, usually a grade zero angle in more than three quadrants, like shown here, uh, which is more than 273 degrees or 270 degrees of the angle. And this tends to follow recurrent attacks of intermittent angle closure as we just uh, discussed briefly in the previous slide. So what is happening? This condition was previously called chronic angle closure glaucoma. Remember, prim acute primary angle closure was called uh, acute congestive glaucoma. This is called chronic angle closure glaucoma. And this is a chronic rise in intraocular pressure due to recurrent attacks of intermittent angle closure, leading to optic neuropathy, cupping, and visual field defects, which is generally asymptomatic. Why is it asymptomatic? It'll just come up. We've also already touched upon it in a bit as well. And thus, this condition behaves like primary open angle, but the difference is when you do gonioscopy, the angles are closed. Um, and what has happened is that, remember in intermittent angle closure, people or patients usually do not seek medical attention because the attack tends to reverse on its own, spontaneously resolve. And this happening again and again, again and again would initiate chronic inflammation in the eye. And as the iris and the cornea can touch each other, grade zero angle and chronic inflammation would then produce fibrotic connections between these these which is called synechi. Synechi means to hold together firmly to something and this is happening in the periphery so this is called peripheral anterior synechi and what this is going to do is going to impede aqueous flow for a constant and sustained period of time thus producing a sustained rise in IOP and this sustained rise in IOP then can cause cupping and visual field effects, 
like primary open angle glaucoma. You would say, but hey, this pressure rise should be more dramatic because the angle is closed and this is a higher pressure. The pressure is usually more than 40 millimeters here as well. The patient does not experience pain or redness because this is chronic inflammation. The pain signals have been attenuated because of recurrent attack of intermittent angle recurrent attacks of intermittent angle closure. And also, there is not much redness because the inflammation is in its chronic phase. It's in the reparative, fibrotic type of inflammation. So this is what happened. You had acute primary angle closure. You had your corneal edema, elevated IOP, mid-dilated pupil. Remember, mid-dilated pupil is the thing that differenti differentiates acute primary angle closure from acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis, which is the same thing when you're doing a torch examination. You saw circumcorneal congestion, and then you can go into intermittent angle closure in which you had self-resolving attacks, which happened again and again, which usually caused glaucoma flecken and iris atrophy, as we described, and you finally end up with primary angle closure glaucoma which has minimum pain and redness because the eye is used to the pain. It's been attenuated, not redness because of chronic inflammation. And this behaves like primary open angle with closed angles, basically. So how do these patients present? Well, they're going to present with gradual painless loss of visual field, very much like patients of primary open angle uh, glaucoma present with. There is minimal redness and minimal pain simply because the inflammation is now chronic. They might give history of intermittent redness and pain in the eye because remember that is what usually brings the patient into a primary angle closure glaucoma state. But also remember not every patient of intermittent angle closure will end up here. Diseases don't read books. So how is this going to present very similar to what primary open angle was? And the signs that you will see are again very similar to what primary open angle was, cupping, visual field effects consistent with glaucoma. Glaucom flecken and iris atrophy continuing on from intermittent angle closure. In intermittent angle closure, these two signs are incidental, i.e. they might be picked up if the patient presents to the doctor for some other reason and, I, and an ophthalmologist for some reason, and he says, hey, you have intermittent angle closure. So there, you, because the patient does not go to the doctor for intermittent angle closure, so glaucom flecken and iris atrophy are incidental signs and in, uh, picked up signs in intermittent angle closure. But they will be seen when the patient goes in with complaints of, uh, or with symptoms and a history which is consistent with primary angle closure glaucoma because the patient, the doctor would see the patient on a slit lamp uh, and would pick up these signs and say, yeah, you had this condition before, which led to this condition. So glaucom flecken and iris atrophy are some things that happen in intermittent angle closure, but are usually picked up when a patient goes uh, with complaints of uh, symptoms uh, which are consistent with primary angle closure glaucoma, simply because patients of intermittent angle closure don't go to a doctor. If they would go to a doctor, they would be picked up. They won't end up here or they probably will not even end up with glaucoma flecken and iris atrophy because you need recurrent attacks for those two things to happen. Or maybe a couple of attacks was something that the patient had had enough of and said, now let's go to a doctor and see why do I keep getting it again and again. And they might be even picked up then. Uh, but briefly what I'm trying to say is glaucoma flecken and iris atrophy are usually seen when a patient goes in uh, for primary angle closure glaucoma rather than intermittent angle closure because they don't go for intermittent angle closure. So how do we manage this primary angle closure glaucoma? You might try medical management as you do with primary open angle because again, we need to achieve a target pressure because we don't want more cupping or visual field effects to take place. So we need to find the target pressure. The protocol for, fi find for finding the target pressure is the same as for primary open angle. So I'm not gonna talk about it here. You can go review it. Uh, so briefly, uh, visual fields over a period of two years uh, to achieve, to see if the target pressure is achieved or not. Medicines usually don't work, so you need to go to do surgery, and the surgery is called trabeculectomy. If trabeculectomy does not work, you can do another trabeculectomy with antimetabolites. If that doesn't work, start medications. If that doesn't work, use a drainage implant. If that doesn't work, destroy a part of the ciliary body. We'll briefly talk about these when we do principles of surgical management. So now we have completed primary angle closure, we are moving on to secondary angle closure, which is a more interesting disease. We are coming to the end, don't worry, we are nearly there. Just like we did for primary angle closure, we are going to start off by classifying uh, secondary angle closure, and this time there are only two conditions, uh, acute secondary angle closure and secondary angle closure glaucoma. Acute secondary angle closure, ASAC, 
is push or pull factors causing a dramatic and sudden rise in intraocular pressure. The AC depth is obviously going to be less than normal. When you do gonioscopy, you're going to see grade one or worse angle in three quadrants or more, implying more than 270 degrees of the angle. Uh, no cupping, no visual field effects, that's no glaucoma. Secondary angle closure glaucoma or SAG, SAGAG, is chronic inflammation due to persistent pull or push factors causing a sustained rise in intraocular pressure. You would see angle closure with cupping and visual field effect, thus glaucoma. You will again see uh, grade one or worse angles, usually grade zero angles in three quadrants, more than three quadrants, uh, which implies more than 270 degrees of the angle. Um, it is possible for acute secondary angle closure to convert into a acute secondary angle closure to convert into a secondary angle closure glaucoma, but as we will see, there are certain conditions that actually present with secondary angle closure glaucoma just bypassing the acute stage altogether. It is also possible for some of the conditions that cause acute secondary angle closure over time to produce secondary angle closure glaucoma, but that's not always necessary. Same was the case with primary angle closures evolution over its four stages from acute primary angle closure to intermittent angle closure to primary angle closure glaucoma. So let's see how the journey this time happens. You have acute secondary angle closure, which is because of pull or push factors, we'll do those push or pull factors causing a certain dramatic rise in IOP, which produces the same red eye that it did in primary acute primary angle closure. But we will have certain other things in the eye, which is because of those pull or push factors. The pupil is not going to be made dilated here anymore. It is going to be of various configurations depending upon the push or pull factors. And again, but not necessarily, this condition can lead into secondary angle closure glaucoma, which is a persistent push or pull factor causing chronic inflammation, causing a sustained rise in intraocular pressure, leading to glaucomatous changes. There are two conditions uh, which do this, which are notorious for doing this. One is new vascularization of the iris, and the other is chronic anterior uveitis. New vascularization of the iris can also lead to acute secondary angle closure. Chronic anterior uveitis usually presents a secondary angle closure glaucoma and not acute secondary angle closure because the inflammation is chronic to begin with, so it tends to bypass acute secondary angle closure state. And chronic anterior uveitis, one of the conditions that is associated with is juvenile immune arthritis, and this then leads to something called uveitic glaucoma. Not uveitis glaucoma, I'll just fix this and come back. It's uveitic glaucoma. There, I fixed it. Also put it in blue, nice, bold, underlined, italic font. I'm human. I make mistakes, but I fixed it. It's uveitic glaucoma, folks, not uveitis glaucoma. Let's talk about epidemiology of secondary angle closure. This condition was once called acute congestive glaucoma associated with ocular conditions. No longer used. Uh, the epidemiology here, if you think about it, would depend upon one of those push-pull factor conditions. And we'll talk about those conditions, but I'll just put a little bit of summary here. If that condition is phacomorphic glaucoma, which is associated, we have talked about phacomorphic glaucoma before, so you know it's because of a mature cataract, and mature cataracts are usually seen in elderly individuals. If your push or pull factors involve acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis, it would have a variable presentation because you have a lot of conditions that can cause acute iritis. So the age and the gender would vary. We'll talk about acute anterior uveitis when we talk about uveitis, I think, which is your next discussion, so you'll find out more. Chronic anterior uveitis, something that may directly lead to a secondary angle closure glaucoma because of chronicity of inflammation bypassing the acute uh, secondary angle closure altogether, is seen in young females because juvenile immune arthritis is seen in young females. New vascularization of the iris can be seen in middle-aged individuals who are uncontrolled diabetics or elderly individuals who are hypertensive and might have suffered retinal vascular occlusion. And these, this epidemiology is obviously applicable to both uh, acute secondary angle closure as well as secondary angle closure glaucoma. Let's start by talking about acute secondary um, angle closure and then we'll talk about mechanism of angle closure. And remember the mechanism is push or pull factors. We'll talk about push factors first. Iris is, being, iris is being displaced interiorly because something is pushing it from behind. And we'll talk about two conditions, phacomorphic glaucoma and acute anterior uveitis, which is also acute iritis. Let's talk about phacomorphic first. And this, in this case, iris is being pushed anteriorly or displaced anteriorly by a push factor. So you know what phacomorphic glaucoma is, large lens, which can block the potential, which blocks the space between the iris and the lens through which the aqueous moves from posterior chamber to anterior chamber since this path is blocked. Aqua starts accumulating in the posterior chamber, pushes the iris forward. Iris becomes bow-like, iris bombi, which blocks the anterior chamber angle, leading to drum rolls, acute secondary angle closure. 
you need to have 360 degrees people block ie this this space between the iris and the lens should be blocked all around the pupil this is incorrectly called glaucoma folks this was from a time when glaucoma was just a uh, high pressure it's incorrectly because it will never lead to those classical visual field effects of cupping because either the cataract from mature would become hypermature or the cataract would come out this is phacomorphic glaucoma see how the light is curving over the iris which is showing you iris bombi or bow like configuration this is obviously from the cornea and this is a mature large lens uh, the other push factor is acute anterior uveitis or acute iritis. This is again going to displace iris anteriorly by pushing it forward. And what happens is when your iris is inflamed, it is edematous and sticky. Both are features of inflammation. Um, and as you will see, both of these features, iris being sticky and edematous, is responsible for a very peculiar appearance of the iris in which the iris, uh, very peculiar appearance of the pupil actually, in which the pupil is irregular and the pupil is small. So what happens is your iris is edematous and sticky and it sticks to the lens producing something called a posterior synechi. When it is stuck to the lens, it again is going to obliterate the space through which the aqueous flows from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber. The aqua starts collecting in the posterior chamber, pushes the iris forward, iris again becomes into a bow-like configuration or an iris bombi configuration which blocks the angle and produces acute secondary angle closure very similar to what was happening in phacomorphic in which iris bombi was also created but in that case it was because of a large lens here it is because of formation of posterior synechi and as i said this inflammation of the iris is responsible for a constricted pupil and also because for an irregular appearance of pupil which forms once you have those posterior synechies so rather than a mid dilated non-reactive pupil something you see in acute primary angle closure you see a small irregular pupil and acute anterior uveitis and both of these things can be seen on a torch and that's my insistence on you uh, essentially picking up picking up the essential sign of acute primary angle closure which is mid dilated non reactive pupil so you can distinguish it from this condition which is acute anterior uveitis in which the pupil is small and irregular Irrespective, posterior synechi leads to blockage of aqueous flow, pushes the iris forward into a bow-like configuration which blocks the angle, produces acute secondary angle closure. The interesting bit is, in spite of the synechi 360 degrees blocking all aqueous flow, producing iris bombi, the pressure does not rise. Pressure only rises in 20% of the cases. In 80% of the cases, they don't. the pressure doesn't rise in spite of all of these things, bowing of the iris, blocking of the angle, Think about why that would happen. Why wouldn't the pressure rise? Uh, these are how posterior synechi appear uh, in acute anterior uveitis, the one shown by circles. And if you look at the white arrows, they are showing you how the iris bombi is going to block the anterior chamber angle. This, uh, the black arrows are obviously showing you the iris bombi or the bowed iris. This is a real picture. And as you can see, the light curves of the iris which is showing you the iris bombi the pupil is small constricted uh blue circle uh, white arrows iris bombi bowed iris and this white line or white light this broader lo longer beam broad beam as i've written here the one by yellow arrows are coming off the the cornea but i want you to pay attention to the light beam as indicated by these white arrows which is coming forward showing you bowed iris or iris bombi so we have two diseases here which produce angle closure by iris bombi if you remember acute primary angle closure also produce acute primary angle closure through iris bombi but their iris bombi was because of a small eyeball here iris bombi is either because of a large lens or posterior synechi so in all of these three conditions you get a pupil block because of three very different mechanisms one is acute primary angle closure where it's because of anatomically small eye the other two are second acute secondary angle closures which is either because of a large lens or posterior synechi formation now we're going to talk about the pull factors and the two pull factors hey acute anterior synechi acute anterior uveitis is back and new vascularization of the iris Let's talk about acute anterior uveitis first because we just finished talking about it. And again, the iris this time, rather than being pushed, is being pulled anteriorly, displaced anteriorly by a pull force. We already talked about posterior synechi <clears throat> because of edematous and uh, sticky iris because of inflammation. But if you think about it, <clears throat> sorry, 
If the iris is edematous, all of the iris is going to be edematous, even from the interior surface of the iris. <coughs> Sorry again. And this interior surface of the iris, once it becomes edematous, it can be thick enough to block the angle, like so. And it's, since it's sticky, it can stick to the angle, closing the angle, causing secondary acute angle closure. Again, that characteristic thing, and we need this to happen in more than three quadrants, these synechies, and these synechies are called peripheral interior synechies. We've talked about them in passing before, and these are formed because the iris is edematous, and it's sticky, and it sticks to the uh, angle and the cornea. Uh, so it, it blocks it, and these are called peripheral interior synechies. So these synechies, which are forming between the iris and the cornea, would obviously block the angle in between because the angle is between the iris and the cornea, if you remember the four structures. And this needs to happen in more than three quadrants, as we've talked about before, more than 270 degrees of the angle. The thing is, peripheral interior synechia are slow to develop. Remember, we talked about them in context of primary angle closure glaucoma, which was because of intermittent angle closure attacks happening again and again, in which the iris and the cornea were in contact with one another, and because of chronicity of inflammation, because of recurrent intermittent, acute, intermittent angle uh, closure attacks, they form these peripheral anterior synechi. So they're slower to form. So they are usually associated with secondary angle closure glaucoma rather than acute secondary angle closure. But it does not mean they cannot cause an acute secondary angle closure. They can, but they're mostly associated with secondary angle closure glaucoma, as we will see uh, when we talk about secondary angle closure, and it's associated with usually chronic uveitis, chronic anterior uveitis. Again, not all cases who have uh, acute anterior uveitis have raised pressure. Only 20% of the cases do. So this is different from iris bombi. No iris bombi here, just iris thick and edematous sticking to the cornea, blocking the angle. But it needs to happen in more than three quadrants. Uh, in order for the possibility of the pressure to rise. And, and even if it happens in three quadrants, only 20% of the cases would present with rise in pressure. Why doesn't everybody present with rise in pressure in acute uveitis or iritis? Think about it. They form slower, so yeah, but posterior synechi form faster, so even there, there was just 20%. Think about it. So yeah, same picture I used again. This is peripheral anterior synechi white arrows. Last time I showed you this picture in the context of posterior synechi producing iris bombi and blocking it. So this picture can be used for multiple purposes. This is a gonioscopic view and you can see the iris very irregular and it's irregular because it is sticking to the cornea. This black line is showing you that maybe with the exception of this place, the iris in this view, in this quadrant of the, of the angle is sticking to the cornea causing forming peripheral anterior synechi and uh, blocking the angle. Maybe only in this region the angle is not brought, blocked, not brought, blocked. This obviously is the iris, this brown structure. The second pull factor is new vascularization of the iris. So this is going to displace the iris anteriorly by pulling it from the front and what happens is you have new vessels on the iris. These form in any condition in which there is ischemia of the retina. We have done one condition, diabetic retinopathy. The other one is retinal vascular occlusion, which we'll do a little later in the clerkship. But in any of these conditions in which there is ischemia of the retina, you have new vessels which bleed, and this blood A can seep into the angle itself, clot, and cause fibrosis of the angle, shutting it down or closing it. And B also pull the cornea towards the angle, as shown by the black arrow, blocking the angle. So by both of these mechanisms, either by pulling the iris and also by clotting and fibrosis within the angle structure cause angle closure or acute secondary angle closure. It's called a pull factor because the iris is pulled anteriorly by the clot forming between the iris and the cornea. But in addition to that iris being pulled, the blood can clot within the angle and cause fibrosis within the angle structures causing a rise in pressure. Uh, and as I said, new vascularization of the iris is seen in retinal ischemic diseases. One very interesting phenomena is, although these new vessels as seen in by this picture lead to acute secondary angle closure, they also lead to secondary angle closure glaucoma. New vascular glaucoma is a type of secondary angle closure glaucoma. And that is because, remember, um, both of these conditions, uh, the new vessel formation on the iris in both proliferative diabetic retinopathy and retinal vascular occlusion is rather a chronic phenomena. 
And these peripheral anterior synechae are also slow to form, which is again associated with chronicity of the disease. Uh, so all of these things are associated with a gradual process that takes place over a bit of time. And the rise in pressure can then be there for long enough and be sustained enough for enough duration of time to actually cause glaucomatous damage. So new vascularization of the iris, unlike acute anterior uveitis, and unlike phacomorphic glaucoma, which hardly ever will never proceed to a glaucomatous stage because the lens either comes out or becomes hypermature. But unlike acute anterior uveitis, which usually presents as acute secondary angle closure, in and that only in 20% of the cases, new vascularization of the iris can not only produce acute secondary angle closure, it produces new vascular glaucoma, which is a type of secondary angle closure glaucoma as well. So this is new vascularization of the iris leading to clotting within the angle. And also you can see here the iris is pulled towards the angle in this point. And this is clotting within the angle, and this is normal. We've already seen a normal angle before. So this is a summary of uh, acute secondary angle closure. It's because of push factors and pull factors. Push factors are phacomorphic glaucoma, acute anterior uveitis, also known as acute, acute iritis. Pull factors, again, acute anterior uveitis, acute iritis. Here, iritis and push factor was posterior synechae. Here it is peripheral anterior synechae and new vascularization of the iris. The thing is, acute anterior uveitis and acute iritis usually does not present with raised pressure and thus does not present with acute secondary angle closure. Remember, only 20% of the individuals do. And the reason is very simple. Inflammation from the iris press to ciliary body shuts it down. Inflammation implies loss of function. New vascularization of the iris, in addition to producing acute secondary angle closure, also produces secondary angle closure glaucoma. New vascular glaucoma, which is a type of secondary angle closure glaucoma. Phacomorphic never proceeds to glaucoma is something that is notorious for producing acute secondary angle closure. It does not proceed to a glaucometer stage because the lens either comes out or goes into a hypermature state. So how do these patients present? Well, the patient is going to present with very similar uh, features as uh, acute primary angle closure because remember once the pressure rises things within the eye are going to be similar the difference is the history and presenting features of the condition the polar push factors leading to acute secondary angle closure so if you have acute iritis you will have recurrent attack of pain photophobia decreased visual acuity which are features of acute iritis and symptoms of comorbid with which iritis is associated we'll talk about that uh, in the next session so there are a lot of conditions in which it is associated and sometimes it's idiopathic. Phacomorphic is obviously going to have a very long history of gradual painless loss of vision because of formation of cataract. New vascularization of the iris, if associated with diabetes, would present as gradual painless loss of vision. Maybe sudden if you have proliferative diabetic retinopathy and get a vitreous hemorrhage. If it is a vascular occlusion leading to new vascularization of the iris, the history would be sudden painless loss of vision. Sometimes patients who have new vascularization of the iris present with a painful blind eye. The pain is because of rise in pressure and the blinding effect is because of ischemia of the retina that's been happening, either because of diabetes or vascular occlusion. So symptoms of rise in pressure, uh, presenting features of rise in pressure, which is a very red and a painful eye together with photophobia and bloody vision, headache and vomiting, things that we talked about when we talked about acute primary angle closure, together with history and symptoms, of what actually brought about an acute secondary angle closure. So when we talk about signs, some signs are going to be very similar to that of acute primary angle closure, which is decreased vision, a hard and tender eye because the pressure is high, circumcorneal congestion because of inflammation, and a hazy, steamy cornea because of loss of sodium potassium pump, one, and two, loss of integrity of those tight junctions. They will not have a mid-dilated non-reactive pupil in acute secondary angle closure. So that's different from acute primary angle closure. And the underlying pathology in both these conditions is ischemia, either acute secondary angle closure or acute primary angle closure. Uh, the difference is in the appearance of pupil and the comorbid that uh, secondary, acute secondary angle closure is associated with, you know, acute iritis, new vascularization of the iris, phacomorphic mature cataract. So the signs would be these 
decreased vision, heart tender, eye circumcondial congestion, hazy cornea, no mid dilated pupil, which is seen in acute primary angle closure, together with a small irregular pupil if it's iritis, if it's a phacomorphic glaucoma, again, glaucoma is used wrong, you'll see a mature cataract. Remember, these are signs. We discussed symptoms in the previous slide. And you'll see uh, new vascularization of the iris, if it's new vascularization, together with diabetic or vascular occlusive changes in the retina, plus the systemic signs of the associated diseases, diabetes or hypertension, or any one of the other diseases. Let's talk about management of acute secondary angle closure. Um, the management principles are sort of similar to acute primary angle closure in the sense that we need to break the acute attack and we do that here so that we can manage one of the underlying conditions because remember we don't have a small eyeball here uh, as was the case with acute primary angle closure as a cause for angle closure. Here we have different push or pull factors and we need to appropriately deal with those so in order to make sure this doesn't the acute attack of acute secondary angle closure doesn't happen again. So we have the same two methods, medical measures or surgical measures, not methods, measures, to break the acute attack. And the aim here is to be able to appropriately deal with the underlying condition that caused the acute attack. So medical management we'll just see is very similar to what we did before with the exception we don't need pilocarpine. Uh, surgical management is again similar uh, to NTH chamber paracentesis. Why don't we need pilocarpine? Because remember, we wanted to pull the iris away from the angle to contract it because we reduced the pressure so that the iris ischemia wasn't there in acute primary angle closure and pilocarpine to pull it away. Uh, here, we don't really need the iris to be pulled away from the angle because the cause of angle closures are very different and we need to deal with those specific causes. So to break, uh, to prevent future attacks, we need to manage those underlying conditions. If it's a phacomorphic glaucoma, just remove the lens once the pressure is, you know, back to normal. Because unless you remove the lens, the eye would go into another attack of acute secondary angle closure. If you have acute anterior uveitis, uh, acute iritis, you start off as steroidal cycloplegic. But it's very important to remember that only 20% of the cases of acute anterior uveitis do actually have uh, raised IOP. So they might not even present to you with the uh, attack of acute secondary angle closure. But if they do, steroid and cycloplegics is the way to go. Cycloplegics are actually going to help dilate the pupil to break the posterior synecy. Remember, posterior synecy are the ones that are responsible for uh, raising the pressure, one of uh, the push factors, as we just discussed moments ago. Um, and if you have a patient who has acute anterior uveitis and you are successfully able to lower the pressure uh, once and you start off appropriate treatment, but the pressure still tends to rise again, you can use anti-glaucoma medications. But the first line anti-glaucoma medication in these patients of acute anterior uveitis are beta blockers, topical beta blockers and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors rather than prostaglandin analogs. Prostaglandins are pro-inflammatory mediators and the eye is inflamed and you give a pro-inflammatory drug, it will make the inflammation work. So we tend to not use prostaglandins in a patient who has active anterior, acute anterior uveitis uh, and high pressure. For neovascularization of the iris, things get a little trickier. Medical management usually does not work to prevent uh, future attacks, uh, you usually need to do trabeculectomy surgery because remember, blood can seep into the angle and cause fibrosis and block the angle in addition to causing peripheral anterior synecy formation. So usually this disease progresses to secondary angle closure glaucoma and it does tend to require surgery, although initially you must always reduce the ischemic stimulus so that new new vessels don't form. Uh, so that uh, or the new vessels that are formed don't continue to sort of you know bleed and bleed and bleed we need those vessels to disappear so we need to reduce the ischemic stimulus which is an ischemic retina uh, so we need to use lasers or anti-VEGF you can go back to discussion of diabetes to see how those work to effectively reduce the ischemic stimulus so that new vessels sort of regress and new 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 vessels don't form but as I said that in spite of best efforts it's usually surgery that needs to be uh, perform trabeculectomy in order to control the IOP. Simply breaking the acute attack and then reducing the stimulus usually does not suffice or work and surgery eventually is required. So this is the medical management of breaking the acute attack. Again, no pilocarpine required. We just need to reduce the pressure so that we can deal with the 
with the actual cost that led to an increase in pressure. Uh, so very similar to what we did before. In fact, apart, with the exception of pyrocarpine, it's exactly what we have talked about before. Now we're moving on to secondary angle closure glaucoma. We have completed our discussion of acute secondary angle closure and now we are moving on to a stage where this sustained rise in IOP because of chronic inflammation, because of persistent pull or push factors uh, is responsible for now glaucomatous changes in the eye because the pressure has been high enough, long enough to actually cause visual field effects and cupping. Uh, when you do gonioscopy on these patients, again, you will see grade one over angles, usually grade zero angles in more than three quadrants, more than 270 degrees of the angle. So let's define this condition as secondary angle closure glaucoma is chronic inflammation due to persistent pull or pull, push or pull factors causing a sustained rise in IOP. The sustained rise in IOP is accompanied by minimal symptoms of pain and redness because inflammation is chronic and leads to optic disc cupping and visual field effects of which the patient is usually unaware because generally he is asymptomatic initially. Uh, and again, this is going to behave like primary open angle glaucoma but with gonioscopically closed angles, usually grade zero angles and more than three quadrants. And they would obviously have a history of one of the underlying etiologies, i.e. of those polar push factors that led to this condition. Once these patients start coming to you, once they become symptomatic. So the etiology of secondary angle closure is, again, any of the push or pull factors uh, that can cause a persistent uh, rise in IOP because of chronicity of inflammation. But as we have talked about before, not all of the push and pull factors can cause or do actually lead to a secondary angle closure glaucoma. It is rare for acute anterior uveitis to do so because a very few patients, about 20%, present with rise in pressure. So that rise in pressure remaining persistent in an acute setting is even more rare. It's not that it's impossible, it is just rare that acute anterior uveitis actually leads to a secondary uh, angle closure glaucoma. Phacomorphic glaucoma does not lead to glaucoma. Isn't that oxymoronic? Uh, because you take the lens out or the lens becomes hypermature and it actually starts shrinking. So what conditions do actually result in a secondary angle closure glaucoma? Well, one, we have done new vascularization of the iris, which leads to new vascular glaucoma. It's actually a pull factor. We have done that before, which is formation of peripheral interior synechia and direct clotting and fibrosis of the angle structures. Uh, which is essentially the trabecular meshwork. The under, other condition is juvenile immune arthritis, which is a systemic condition which produces a chronic anterior uveitis in the eye. And this chronic anterior uveitis does lead to uveitic glaucoma. It's again a pull factor, which again produces peripheral anterior synechia in response to the chronic inflammation in the eye or chronic uveitis. So these two conditions do and can actually present as uh, secondary angle closure glaucoma or do actually lead to, which is a better way of saying, do actually lead to uh, secondary angle closure glaucoma. We'll talk a little more uh, about juvenile immune arthritis and chronic anterior uveitis when we talk about uveitis in general. So how do these patients present? Well, they're going to be presenting with, again, loss of visual fields. Uh, they can also present with loss of vision, and I'll just tell you why that is in a bit, and with a history of one of the push or pull factors that actually led to a secondary angle closure glaucoma. It is, again, relatively painless with the possible exception of new vascular glaucoma because new vascular glaucoma can actually present with pain because you might have acute exacerbation of the inflammatory process within the eye, especially if the underlying disease is uncontrolled, either di uh, diabetic retinopathy, which continues to worsen, or one of the causes of vascular occlusion, which hasn't been managed or dealt with properly. Uh, the presentation, again, as I said, visual acuity in these patients might be affected. Remember, glaucoma is a disease that usually affects visual field, but the visual acuity is affected not because of the glaucomatous changes, it's because of the effect of the underlying condition that is affecting the vision. For example, when we take the example of neovascular glaucoma, the retina is already ischemic, ischemic enough to cause proliferation, which might have already reduced visual acuity a lot. And, and you can also have cataract formation. You can have cataract formation in diabetes. You also have cataract formation in response to chronic inflammation in the eye and chronic uveitis, as seen in juvenile immune arthritis. Uh, the rest of the symptoms of uh, visual field loss are very similar, inability to see cars passing by and propensity to bump into people, 
as you're walking, uh, the, these are very similar to what we saw in primary open angle glaucoma. The signs, again, of specific to glaucoma are going to be very similar across all entities of glaucoma cupping and visual field effects. Uh, we have talked about those. You can go back and refer to the discussion of open angle glaucoma to see what they are or just review them. And then you're going to have signs that are specific to the underlying disease that led to uh, secondary angle closure glaucoma. In case of uveitic glaucoma, you would have a very specific history of uh, joint inflammation, features of joint inflammation, and the patient is usually a young female. Uh, in new vascular glaucoma, you usually have history and features of retinal ischemic diseases. So you can have middle-aged, old-aged individuals with history of diabetes, systemic hypertensive diseases, etc. So how do we manage these individuals? Well, as I've said before, that just like with primary angle closure glaucoma, you need to achieve a target pressure and obviously deal with any of the push-pull factors appropriately as we just discussed. Medical management is usually not successful in achieving target pressure, and we have to fall back to uh, surgery, which is again trabeculectomy. I am saying this again and again, neovascular glaucoma is a very difficult condition to manage, and for it, medical management almost always is guaranteed to fail, and you have to do surgery. Uh, if you do want to try medical management, um, maybe, for example, the inflammation in the eye is a uh, little active, we can do follow the protocol that we did for primary open angle glaucoma, but with the condition that you can't use prostaglandins if you have active inflammation within the eye. Surgical management is again trabeculectomy. We have talked about it before in context of primary angle closure glaucoma. If surgery, trabeculectomy fails, do an edit trabeculectomy with antimetabolites. If that fails, start medications again. If that doesn't work, you can do glaucoma drainage implants. If that doesn't work, you can do partial destruction of the ciliary body. Our train is nearly at the station. We are going to be talking about principles of surgical management of angle closure glaucoma and essentially other angle closure entities as well. Um, so the indications for surgery are obviously cases of primary and secondary angle closure glaucomas where target pressure cannot be achieved otherwise. For cases of primary and secondary acute angle closures, the indication would be failure to maintain IOP in normal range. The surgical options are listed here, and if we, one doesn't work or fails, you move to the other. So you can start with trabeculectomy, move on to trabeculectomy with antimetabolites, use medical therapy after trabeculectomy with medical, with antimetabolites, glaucoma drainage implant, and then partial destruction of ciliary body, which is called cycloablation, cycloablation can be done with laser, which is then called cyclophotoablation can be done with cold or cryotherapy, uh, which is then called cyclocryoablation. So let's talk about trabeculectomy. Trabeculectomy is also called filtration surgery. And what we do is we create an alternate pathway for the aqueous to exit the eye. And this is done by creating a filtration port in the sclera by producing a partial thickness incision into it. I'll show you a video which would explain this very well. And what would ha then happen is aqueous would start uh, draining through this filtration port underneath the conjunctiva and would raise the conjunctiva into a bleb, a drainage area, which is called a bleb, right here. And the aqueous from here is slowly absorbed by the blood vessels on the conjunctiva. We always perform a peripheral iridotomy if a trabeculectomy is done in case of uh, angle closures uh, so that this opening, fil uh, this fil uh, uh, filtration port that's been created is not blocked by the peripheral iris. Uh, trabeculectomy is again, as I've said before, is also a procedure of choice in cases of uh, acute primary and secondary angle closures uh, if uh, the IOP is not maintained within normal range and it also can be used in primary angle closure glaucoma if target IOP cannot be achieved. So this is that bleb I was talking about, and this is the peripheral uh, iridotomy or iridectomy, and this bleb is basically created because the aqueous is collecting underneath it, and these conjunctival vessels will slowly absorb the aqueous. Bleb is good. It's telling you that the your trabeculectomy is working. And since this bleb is, the surgery is done at the 12 o'clock position, the bleb is covered or hidden by the upper leg. Let's, uh, so, before we see a video on trabeculectomy, let's just quickly talk about trabeculectomy with antimetabolites, which is done if 
uh, a plain trabeculectomy fails, plain would be without uh, uh, anti-metabolites, and it usually fails because you are creating this filtration port in sclera. And in spite of the fact that sclera is a very poorly healing tissue because it has a very relatively, it's not very vascular as, it, as compared to other tissues of the eye, but it does and can heal. And this filtration port would then close. So in order to retard the healing, we can use antimetabolites. And the two most commonly used antimetabolites are mitomycin C, MMC, and 5-chlorouracil. Let's see the video uh, and see how it goes. So this is the site where we will do a trabeculectomy. And the first thing we do is obviously raise the conjunctiva. Here what we do is we take a sponge and apply some mitomycin C underneath the area underneath the conjunctiva over the sclera where we would like to do surgery this mitomycin c is obviously going to retard the healing of sclera so our filtration port doesn't uh, get blocked uh, over time or over time obviously surgery can be done without mitomycin then we create a partial thickness incision in the sclera and we sort of replace the scleral flap over the cornea and now we are looking at a position like this this is the conjunctiva this is the sclera we take a bit of the sclera and a bit of the trabecular tissue out from here and we are now directly communicating with the anterior chamber. This is the iris that we have right here and once we do this we are also going to perform our iridotomy so that this piece of iris, peripheral iris plug or cover the hole or the filtration pore that we have created. Then we are going to stitch it and this is the passage through the sclera that the aqueous is going to take to get out of the eyes. This is our filtration port. We did the iridotomy, so this, this part of peripheral iris does not block our opening. And then we will stitch this part of the conjunctiva back on. Um, these sutures, with sutures obviously, um, right here. So this is the path that the aqueous is taking. It starts collecting underneath the conjunctiva, produces that characteristic bleb. And this bleb, from this bleb through the conjunctival vessels, the aqueous would be absorbed. And since this is done at the 12 o'clock position, the blab is usually covered by or hidden by the upper lip. So this is how trabeculectomy is performed. Trabeculectomy with anti-metabolites like mitomycin C is done the same way it was shown in the video. If you're doing it without mitomycin, you just sort of skip that step. So what are the complications of trabeculectomy? Overfiltration, underfiltration. Overfiltration is when too much of the aqueous is getting out of the eye. The eye pressure is very low and simply you can reconstruct your wound, add some more stitches uh, so that uh, less aqueous flows out your filtration port. If it's under, filter, under filtering, you can remove some of the suture so that more aqueous can filter out of the drainage uh, area or the filtration port that was created. Not the drainage area, the filtration port that was created. Uh, blebitis is probably the worst thing that could happen is an infection, usually bacterial within the bleb. Um, and this is a very dangerous condition uh, because this infection from the blab can actually move into the eye to cause endophthalmitis and it needs to be very aggressively treated with fortified topical antibiotics to prevent endophthalmitis. Obviously, you do take your specimen for culture and sensitivity before starting off the antibiotics. Fortified antibiotics are very similar to the ones that we were using in the case of keratitis. If you do have endophthalmitis that sets in, then we need to use intravitreal antibiotics in addition to what we are already using for blebitis. And obviously, we need to take a little bit of vitreous sample for our culture sensitivity before we uh, start off with intravitreal antibiotics. Various types of blebitis in A and B and C, it is blebitis with endophthalmitis. A and B shows blebs which are filled with pus. C also shows hypopion. I'm sure you know what a hypopion is now. We have talked about hypopion in keratitis and I think before as well when we were talking about complications of cataract surgery you can see a hazy cornea and a very congested eye so this is white arrows are all blebitis black arrow is hypopion this is congestion of the eye uh, as seen in endophthalmitis and this is a hazy cornea which uh, in picture C all of these features together is suggestive of endophthalmitis if you're still not sure you can do a B scan and Endophthalmitis essentially applies infection within the eye, which would imply infection within the vitreous cavity. Vitreous is liquid protein, very good culture medium for the bacteria. Vitreous usually on a B scan is completely uh, anechoic, does not produce any reflections. We have an entire video on B scan. You can, you are more than welcome to see it if you want to learn more about it. Uh, and if you have endophthalmitis, you are going to see membranes 
and also echoes within the vitreous, which is indicative of an inflammatory process. And this is a picture that you're likely to see the picture on the right in an endophthalmitis. So step one is uh, trabeculectomy. Step two is trabeculectomy with antimetabolites. Step three is medical management after uh, trabeculectomy with antimetabolites if that does not work for you. So the treatment or the protocol used is the same for primary open angle glaucoma. We are trying to achieve a target pressure. The exception is if you have active inflammation within the eye prostaglandin, you should be avoided making beta blockers the first line in the therapy. Then we have four, which is drainage implants. Drainage implants are specialized devices that can take the aqueous out of the eye. They are generally of three types, Ahmed glaucoma valve, AGV, which is the one which is most commonly used. This is from Mateen Ahmed, who is actually Nigerian, I think. Uh, he's now in the US, obviously. He came up with this Ahmed glaucoma valve. He was tired of treating patients in Africa uh, and moved to the US. Not tired in the sense that he did not want to do it anymore. He just wanted to make the life, life of those people better. But he ended up inventing the Ahmed glaucoma valve. The two other types are Maltino and Bereldet or Bereldet, Berwelt, Berwelt. Uh, they are both non-valve designs. Ahmed glaucoma valve is already a valve design. We have a picture here. This is a long tube and this tube is inserted into the anterior chamber as shown in this animation. And this actually takes the aqueous out to this plate. Before the plate, the tube enters into a valve. And this is basically to sort of, you know, control the flow of aqueous. And then the aqua spreads over this plate. This plate is underneath the conjunctiva where a bleb forms. And again, from that bleb, you have uh, aqueous that is absorbed uh, into the blood vessels of the conjunctiva uh, where it is then sort of uh, you know, removed from the bleb. Um, let's just quickly look at how this is done. So you just excising the conjunctival tissue here. And this is a patient who has had keratoplasty done. You can see the donor cornea being sutured, already sutured to the host. You can see so many sutures running around. We talked about keratoplasty when we talked about conjunctivitis and keratoconus. Now we are creating a partial thickness opening in the sclera through which the tube would enter into the interior chamber. Let me just feed it up. Here we go. This is our hemat glaucoma valve. It's just being tested. You can see fluid coming out of here. It's supposed to be detected that the uh, valve is patent. So this part goes in under the conjunctival pocket. It's sutured into place. And the tube would be cut to length and inserted into the anterior chamber through this partial thickness scleral incision that was created. So it's just being cut to length here. A suture is applied around the tube. Well, this is a silicon tube. You're just applying a light suture, not a very tight suture. So to hold the suture, to hold the tube in place, you don't want the lumen of the tube to be kinked. And this is how the surgery is then completed. So this is a very short video where has to how the valve is placed. And valve is obviously number four. If trabeculectomy, then with antimetabolites and medical management, all have failed to work. This is cycloablation, which is partial destruction of the ciliary body. I say partial, you never destroy the entire ciliary body, which would imply no aqueous production, which would basically means killing the eye, which is called thysis. We'll talk more about thysis when we talk about ocular trauma, I think. This is you using a cord or cryoprobe to part destroy the part of the ciliary body. This is using laser to do the same. And this has to be done very carefully because you never destroy all of the ciliary body, you only destroy a part of it. And this is when other of the modalities have failed. Finally, these two are very rare complications of very high pressure in the eye. Uh, so central retinal vein and artery occlusion. The pressure is so high that it can actually occlude the artery, the central retinal artery, the pressure within the eye because of angle closure, uh, usually 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury or even higher and persistently high. Uh, sometimes when you're getting LASIK surgery done, refractive surgery, the pressure is raised to keep the eyeball stable for a very short period of time. Even that can lead to transient uh, vascular occlusion. But those are transient because they are occurring for a very, very small period of time. 
This we have seen before, and this is basically your differentials of red eye, very easy differentials, those that can be picked up with torch and talking to your patients. We have done almost all of these conditions except this acute anterior uveitis, which is our next discussion, so then that will be complete. Do go over it. Uh, it tells you how to differentiate between these conditions in a very simple manner. Um, so it's a very good review aid. Thank you very much. I hope you've had fun. And I hope that this was relatively easy for you uh, since I have tried to, you know, pick and choose classifications that make sense out of angle closure, which is a minefield, people. It's a minefield. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, you know where to ask.